So with that, let's go to our first question. So again, three questions, each are gonna take a turn addressing it. The first is, what kinds of projects should we be working on with these new funds? Or what are, what are the right projects to be working on? So, Cole. Uh, good morning, all. Um, thank you for having us up here, first and foremost. Um, when it comes to determining what the right mix of projects are and the right types of projects are, we have to create a balance between our strategic alignment within the department as well as the actual goals and needs of each district perspective. So from a TPP and a central perspective, we use a lot of the tools that we, that we have to not only manage the portfolio of projects, but also manage the develop and different types of authority. We, uh, we collect data on a, uh, you know, from, a, from a mass perspective from all the different uh, tools that we have from our data infrastructure team, and we can provide that data to you. Um, you know, we're serving as a central model for a, lot of this, uh, for a lot of these initiatives and a lot of these funding sources that come out, as you know, with the UTP. So what we can do from a central perspective is provide you with that right authority, with that right ability to, to, to align your portfolios. Um, it's not necessarily a project management type approach that we're going to be taking, but more of a portfolio management. Um, but in giving that, we'll be able to give you all the tools, communicate to those different divisions, communicate to those different stakeholders involved, MPOs, uh, you know, consultants, everybody who's involved in the entire process to ensure that everybody's aware of what's going to be coming their way as, the pro as projects move throughout the life cycle of their process. Good morning, everyone. I think Aggieland is rubbing off on me, so I'm going to start by saying howdy. Howdy. <laughs> oh, awesome. Um, you know, uh, you see this graph here in this chart for us in, in Dallas. Um, we started the year in 20, when we started uh, 2015, we we're planning to let about $460 million. When we finished the year, we let over, we doubled that, $920 million. So that's a blessing. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing for us. But I don't think it's a sustainable approach. You know, you can't double your letting within the fiscal year that you're that you're moving on. Um, I think the question is, how do we deliver the right project? Uh, not just how do we deliver projects. Um, we can easily go ahead and spend billions of dollars, but did we really get the biggest bang for our buck? I think that's important. House Bill 20, if you're familiar, if you're not familiar with that, is gonna is gonna kind of force us to kind of head in that direction. Um, our MPOs. And, uh, and us, we're all gonna be heading in the right direction. They have to create a 10-year plan. And there are certain things that they have to factor uh, when, we, when we create that 10-year plan. So no longer does Text.Have is UTP only, but MPOs will have their 10-year plan as well. Um, it's really important to think about how this is gonna impact uh, our long-range plan. You know, we need to think about uh, MPOs need to be involved. We don't deliver projects by ourselves, and we probably sh we should not deliver projects out by ourselves. We need to make sure that the project is in the MTP, supported by the MPO, and then we need to gather around the table and make sure that the project scores high enough and we get the biggest bang for our buck moving forward. So planning becomes really, really important, looking at all this additional funding that's gonna be coming our way. All right, thank you. And we're gonna hold the questions to the end, uh, just in the interest of time. So next question uh, for Colt and Mo: How do we progress environmental right-of-way and utility adjustments and address long lead time requirements for these projects? All right, yeah, and Mo Grade made a great point there talking about House Bill 20 and the different types of projects that we're going to be developing. Uh, when it comes from the TPP standpoint, really from the whole uh, state standpoint, yes, this is the this is the key, you know, letting our stakeholders and our districts and divisions and others know what's going to be coming through the pipeline. You know, it's communication at its, at its finest, really. Um, it's all about creating a real development plan and then initiating that plan and, and almost planning optimistically and letting our projects conservatively in a lot of ways. So when we, when we come up to manage our, our portfolio of projects, what we're going to be looking at is not only that you know, we have the right projects moving through, but we're also going to be making sure that everybody is aware. Uh, I think in a lot of times there's all these different lists of projects out there and everybody wonders, which list do I use? So I think from a central perspective, we want to we want to eliminate as much of that as possible and create that one singular list that everybody has the ability to plan off of. Not only a list of projects, but also where they where each project is in that funnel and how the development is, is progressing. 
So as we let our folks in right away know to start creating their budgets, and same way with, uh, with our engineering budgets and our, in and our environmental teams, we want to let them know what's in the pipeline coming their way so they can plan their budgets accordingly. Uh, you know, as my, as my experience in the right-of-way division showed, we had a, a lot of projects that we were working on that were post-letting. So with that being said, we want to eliminate that as, as much as possible, uh, but also give the ability for each division to know uh, what they need to be working on going forward. Because if you're trying to set your budgets, if you're trying to plan to get your stakeholders and, and your personnel in the right position, you have to know exactly what, what is funded, what is, what has the right amount of authority, and what has the ability to move through the funnel. So from a, uh, also from a central perspective, we're also going to make sure that all the stakeholders involved have all those informa have all that information and attend the quarterly meetings. So that's going to be a kickoff and a, and a new change that we're going to be looking at, having these meetings with everybody and going over their portfolios. Uh, not necessarily in a, in a derogatory way in any sense, but in a way to, to open those lines of communication. So I think from a central perspective, we are going to be the conduits of communication. Um, and uh, with that said, we're going to be reaching out to all the different divisions and districts and, and letting them know what's going to be in the pipeline coming their way. Thank you. I think this is an easy question, right? I mean, we've, <laughs> if you work for TxDOT or you work with TxDOT, this is a question that we've been asking since I've joined the department since 1997. It seems like an easy question, but it's really hard to answer. Um, and it's going to get harder with all, this so all these new sources of funding coming our way. You know, we, we use this dashboard. And I, if you were in our Monday's meeting, um, uh, Mr. Hoffman kind of talked about this dashboard that we're trying to develop so we can create transparency. So I look at this dashboard, and it has all our entire portfolio. Every CSJ that we have in DCIS in the Dallas district, and hopefully this will be rolled out to all 25 districts, and we're all going to have that transparency. We, from a district perspective, this helps me to see where my projects are at. So if you look at the far right column, those are the jobs that we're gonna that are funded that we're gonna let in the next four years. Well, that's what we're supposed to let. There's no nothing strange about that. The districts know what they're gonna let in the next four years. Uh, the right of way division knows what's coming their way. ENV knows what's coming their way. Traffic operations, if they're doing um, uh, railroad exhibits, exhibit A's, they know what's coming their way. So that's kind of easy, but. All we have is four, red, oh, four projects ready to let. And you're going to hear me keep talking about this. And my boss, District Engineer Kelly Selman, we talk about ready to let dates every single day. And we cannot focus on let dates anymore. Those days of talking about letting dates and gearing our resources based on letting dates, those have to go. We need to focus on ready to let date. I'm almost like kind of tempted to say, go to DCIs and take the letting date and scratch it off <laughs> and put ready to let date. That way, we're speaking the same language. Um, districts are speaking the same language. We're focused on the same day. If I go to right of way division, I said that I need these resources. They know exactly what my ready to let date is. EMVs on, the, on board, all the divisions on board, and we owe it to them. We owe it to our divisions to kind of give them a, tra a transparent, clear picture of where we are. PEPS knows what what's needed because it's set on ready to let date, not set on a letting date. Uh, our MPOs are focused on on uh, ready to let date. Uh, that's the way to move up. The worst thing that could happen if you have a ready to let data and you don't get the funding, guess what? The project sits on the shelf. That's, just, that's just the worst thing that could happen. And I think I would like to live in that world instead of trying to add double my portfolio in the same fiscal year. You know, trying to balance the two, I would like, I would rather to be on that side of it. Um, where we want to go in order for us to be able to catch up with our ready to let date, if you see the second column from the right where it says UTP funded years 5 through 10. And under the develop authority, and you see the fourth column from the right, sorry, um, 11 PSWA. From this perspective, I would like to know what those jobs are. I have the ability to, on those two columns, even though they're not funded for construction, I can set a ready to let date in the next four years. I can advance the planning, the feasibility studies, the schematic, the environmental documents, the right of way map. I can advance the PSNE. I can advance to even purchasing the right of way. So I, and then as soon as I'm done with that, I can move those projects to backlog, which is project is ready to let and it's ready to go on the shelf. 
TPP, Colt, and, and Jessica, they give us a, a salary cap. I don't, I'm going to talk about NFL here in a second, kind of metal, NFL metaphor. <laughs> but I have a salary cap. I can't just advance everything I want. And I shouldn't advance everything that I want. I should, you know, I should be able to go ahead and sit down with my MPO and have that, have that cap. But what's important is I would like to see those columns, everything go to backlog. As many of those jobs hit backlog so I can have them ready. So if Prop 7 gets passed, uh, keep your fingers crossed, then we have the ability to go ahead and get those, get those jobs uh, advanced as, as soon as possible. So the, right, the far right column is where, where we are. That's what we should do anyways. But the column, the second column from the right and the fourth <laughs> column from the right, those are the columns that we really, really need to advance moving forward. And this dashboard gives us the district transparency and gives the divisions uh, an idea of what's coming down their way. question and then we'll take questions from the audience. So the last one is how do we determine which projects should go to consultants and really Mo is going to kind of lead this one from a district perspective on how he manages that for Dallas. No project should go to consultants. Drop the mic. Drop the mic. You know when you go to that previous <laughs> slide that we had there is no way we would have been able to double our portfolio. Let you know we planned 460 million and we ended up letting 920 million dollars without our colleagues in the consulting community. No way. And for that, we really appreciate them stepping up to the game. We're doing schematic and PSNE at risk, We're trying to get them out. Different consultants working together. They put the resources together. Uh, they helped us a great deal. Um, so without without having the consultant community to deliver projects key projects, we're going to have billions of dollars, not millions of dollars additional, billions of dollars coming to the, coming our way. And without the, our consultants being in the, in the room, that's not, gonna, that's not going to happen. So I look at, we look at it from multiple ways. First, we owe it to our staff and to you, the consultant community, to make sure that our teams internally are busy, that they're designing projects and not all CAD one jobs. We want our teams to be designing multiple types of projects complex jobs, diverse jobs, we want them to get trained. So the first thing we look at internally is we look at, hey, what do we have coming down the pipeline? And we sit down with our designers and say, what can you design? What can you, what can you do? And for example, in Dallas, we're going to be doing a SPUI in-house, a single point urban interchange. Uh, we're doing the schematic in-house, then we're going to take it over and Mr. Gann is here, and David, I'm volunteering you, but David's team is going to be doing the design for that. Our engineers, EAs, uh, professional engineers, they're going to get the experience of designing a, a single point urban interchange in-house. Why is that good for us? Because long term, we need to make sure that our employees are, are uh, well-rounded, um, they got vast experience, and then for the consultant community, we owe it to you to give you a PM that knows what they're managing, right? We don't want to give you a PM that all they did their whole career is a bridge replacement job or CAT1 job or just they were kind of siloed. In order for them to do a good job managing you and make your life easier to get your projects out the, out the door, you kind of want to trust that this is a well, well um, uh, 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 put machine in place. Next thing we do with our portfolio is that we don't just say, we don't, I don't go to David and say, David, can you do this job? And say, oh, no, I can't, no. We, we sit down around the room and we look at his, uh, his internal capacity. Uh, what you see here is a, an actual chart uh, that we do uh, twice a year for our internal teams. Uh, we sit down, what you see in green is what they are allocated today, what they have. Uh, what you see the different lines is uh, if they work 40 hours a week, if they work 10% overtime. So you can see that the, the certain quarters, they're in blue, they're already over. And then we say, hey, David, if we give you the SPUI, for example, what's that going to do to your workload? And additional work is what you see in, in the dark, well, I shouldn't say burnt orange, I'm going to say dark brown. Um, uh, the, what you see there is, hey, so we look at David's workload and say, you know what, uh, if we give you this additional job, we cannot get it started that, on that uh, quarter number three, right? Because you're already over, you got plenty of play. But if we started a little bit later and we have a ready to let, so we have a start date and we have a ready to let date, we put it in our, uh, in our tool, and then how much can you handle? And we work with this on every project with every one of our teams to make sure that they're uh, busy, and then everything else that's left over, we're gonna reach out to our consultant community and say, hey, we need your help. Come help us out and, 
and um, get this get these projects out the door. So um, the key here is, and there's some projects here that are going to be also complex that maybe we don't have the internal resources to do in house. We had a 345 job that we just led in September. It had complex finite element testing and. Um, um, it quite, we didn't quite really know what we were doing, so we needed specialized expertise to come to the table and help us in that area, and we reached out to the consultant community. So um, uh, the key here is to be an extension of our staff, to support TxDOT, uh, to be an extension of um, uh, uh, our additional uh, resources that we might need because we can't beef up and lower as much as easy as you guys can do. And then at the same time, um, maybe if a project is um, – is a specialized job, that's when we reach out to our consultant community. Okay. Now we can take questions uh, from the audience. I think we're doing pretty decent on time. We have about five or ten minutes left. Any questions for Mo or Colt? If not, I have a follow-up question for you, Mo. No questions? Okay. Oh, there you go. You got one. Oh, I do? I'm sorry. Um, well, I think uh, that's a good question. Um, internally, we've uh, been having ready to let dates um, for probably the last, since 2009, 2008. So I think our staff is bought into that. I think I, as, a, as, a, as an agency, we need to make sure that we're all, all of us, districts, divisions, officers, we're all talking the same language. Um, and uh, it's also important to you know get our stakeholders on the table, uh, MPOs, um, elected officials, uh, local local um, uh, officials that we work with. So, but I think internally, it's within our own design staff, our own advanced project development teams, and I think we we're there. And then we got to be able to share that information with our divisions uh, and offices so that they know you know what our ready to let date is not or what our letting date is. Um, I think that's probably the start. I don't know if I – does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. I'll, I'll kind of piggyback on that as well. From a central perspective, it is all about making sure that we, we're all talking the same language. Um, you know, 25 districts, 25 different understandings of what each stage is. Um, it, Jessica, if you could go back to the uh, to the funnel photo there, um, or the next one, excuse me. Uh, this is going to be the same model that we're going to – or the uh, the portfolio, excuse me. Um, from, a, from a portfolio standpoint and a central model, this will be the same similar type system that we're going to be looking at. So we're going to roll up all the different, you know, languages that every, every district speaks. And when I say languages, what I mean is the different uh, information systems that you use. Everybody's a little bit different when it comes to those, those bits of information. So, um, you know, there's been teams out, you know, helping you to create, you know, models like this. And if they haven't been to you, they will be there soon. From a central model perspective, we take all that information in and it, it gives us one same language of, of what's in those statuses. So what we're also doing in, in terms of making sure that we have the right mix in there is we're mapping back that data, that information, and creating uh, you know, tangencies of, of what each one of those projects means. So that way when we look at your funnel, we're saying we're not seeing, you know, 99% of all projects in Cat 1 or one of those different categ uh, funding categories. Now we're looking at more of the purpose of what the projects are in your portfolios. Um, as I stated earlier, every district's a little bit different. They all have their own needs and goals and, and objectives to, to, uh, to the people of their communities. So by having those lines of communication with, with just us to, uh, from a central perspective to each district, We'll be able to create those levels um, and then determine which projects we do need to move up, which ones need the construct authority, which projects are in, in, its, in its phase of development. Uh, we've mapped out our process and, you know, to, to everybody's understanding is not a lot has changed over what has been written in the books over the years. So all we're going to do now is take that, those bits of information, put them back out there so everybody is, uh, you know, using the same terms and the same, same terminology. So, so that's a good question. Um, so 
some of these jobs that um, that we have in here. So we have, for example, Southern Gateway, and we have LBJ in our portfolio. Um, the delivery method hasn't been set in stone yet, uh, but as far as we have it right now, our future jobs, those are included in our portfolio, yes. Because um, the way we look at it, that's important. Um, the delivery method dictates a lot of things um, as far as resources that are gonna be needed. You know, is right of way gonna be purchased uh, via the contract, the SPD contract, or is it gonna be purchased through us? But it doesn't matter. For future years, we included all those SPD projects as part of our portfolio. Or candidate SPD projects mm -hmm. in our portfolio. Another question over here. You know, one thing we notice, even with Prop 1, we notice that our consultants are kind of getting stretched thin. Um, we're calling consultants to the office to do some work authorizations, and they're like, can I, can I come next week? Um, but I'm not, I'm not too concerned about that. Um, I think as far as the planning side, the ps &E side, I think that's kind of our bread and butter, even within the consultant industry, so that doesn't concern me as much. What concerns me more is, and John Campbell is here, this, this, you know, do we have, a, you know, we're gonna have over a billion dollars in right of way that we're gonna be purchasing easy. You know, is, is John, does John have the resources he needs? And we need to have that conversation. Does e and have the resources he needs? Because all those jobs, regardless of what it is, it needs to be environmentally cleared. Um, uh, do the districts have enough people to manage these consultants? We have a project delivery office. Um, so if we're gonna be at advancing all these jobs, do we have enough FTEs? So, so those are some of the concerns that, that, that we need to think about. And I think having this dashboard and we're starting these conversations, our administration is already asking us what's our plan and we're going down the board uh, 16, 17, 18, 19. We have a four year plan and not just what we plan, but what's coming down the pipeline. Um, and I think we're, gonna, we're having these conversations as we speak. So I'm, start, I'm glad we're starting them early that, than later. Um, and I'll say from a central perspective, that's the real purpose behind a lot of these dashboards to say these, all these projects in here are not going to let this year, but they're going to let in the next few years. So from a district perspective, it gives you the ability to set your, your PEPs budgets, your different budgets that you have based on what's coming that way. And same way with the environmental and the right of way in those specific districts and those in the divisions. So, from from that perspective, what you what you're you know what it gives you the ability to do is not only see what's coming through the pipeline to plan to partner with our consultants and with our with our local agencies and MPOs to really to illustrate and show them what is going to be coming. And when you see you know a billion dollars coming through and and almost uh, you know coming into the next four years, I mean it's a it's a huge. Uh, implication on your on your district, uh, especially for the metro areas. Um, so in a lot of ways, this tool does just that. It gives us the ability to forecast, to see, to plan. So.
anticipate those impacts and strategize about minimizing those impacts from the very, very get-go. So uh, I, I think that it's a very, very important part of as we turn a corner to approach a portfolio management, we've got to look at the utility impacts first and foremost, and we've got to equip the communities to address them. Hey, that's a great point, John, and I did want to bring up, and that's, you know, it kind of hits it on the head. This, you know, without the communication channels and, and letting people know what's going to be expected and letting, you know, the districts and divisions know what is going to be expected in the future, um, it's great to have a project out there with our current perspective it says there's a project in this phase. However, what's needed as it progresses through? Those bits of information are, are key. Those are the bits of information that as we alert our, our separate divisions and our, and our partners in those different agencies, as we alert them, we'll be able to give them that list. So there are tools and mechanics to, to developing that, and that's what we're, our focus is going to be. It's pretty much exactly 9 o'clock, so I think we will wrap it up there. Please uh, thank you.